Dr. Uh, Omar Khan. Dr. Khan is uh, president and CEO of the Delaware Health Science Alliance. And he's uh, also um, co-investigator and director of the um, community engagement and outreach component of the Delaware Clinical and Translational Research Program. As you know, the we are the Hispanic Alliance for Clinical and Translational Research. For those of you that do not know me, I'm Carlos Luciano, one of the principal investigators. And the um, Delaware Clinical and Translational uh, Research Program, the AXEL, is our one of our uh, brothers in uh, the Alliance, in the IDEA program of the NIH. Um, so Dr. Um, Omar Khan is also chair of our external advisory committee. He's a practicing family physician um, and um, he's been very kind um, and offer himself to give us a talk about community engaged research um, as a major um, foundation of uh, clinical and translational research. And we'd like to welcome Dr. Ken, who's been a great, um, a great collaborator as uh, for Puerto Rico and also for uh, our uh, Alliance program. Dr. Ken, thank you very much for being with us today and speaking to us about this important uh, topic. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Luciano. Uh, is the volume still okay at this level? We can hear you uh, very well, thanks. Very good, thank you so much. And Dr. Luciano and the entire team at the Hispanic Alliance for Clinical and Translational Research and the University of Puerto Rico as one of the key members there, uh, really appreciate the, the time. Um, uh, it has been a pleasure for me to interact with our colleagues in the Alliance for over the last uh, several years, really, through your journey uh, to actually becoming the Alliance and to having the CTR program find a home in Puerto Rico as well. And we'll talk a little bit about the journey from our perspective and specifically about the importance of community engagement, which to me is a cornerstone of all kinds of research, but especially clinical and translational research. Um, I have been coming to... Um, uh, Puerto Rico for uh, for many years. Um, I probably the first time I came to the island was uh, over 15 years ago, and I typically visit to see friends and for work, and uh, of course to to enjoy as much as I can. For, uh, certainly once a year or so. A couple of years ago, I took this photo. seemed like an appropriate one to uh, start off on uh, the sunrise in the morning, as seen from Fajardo. Um, just before we start, I wanted to give you a sense of where we are as another uh, small uh, part of the United States, uh, one of the smallest states in the country, and the first state, in fact, the US, I'm based in Delaware. And um, so for those of you who have visited the East Coast, you may be familiar with the Philadelphia uh, area, and uh, you may be familiar with this, this gentleman here, who also hails uh, from, from Delaware. And there he is, President Biden, at that time, Vice President Biden, speaking at an event at the University of Delaware, where there is a school of public policy that is named after him. So as you see, Delaware is here. We are surrounded by Pennsylvania, New Jersey, uh, Maryland, and DC, and a little bit more to the South, Virginia. So as I mentioned, we're the first state. We're about uh, one third the land area and population of Puerto Rico, quite a bit smaller than Puerto Rico. Second small state in the country by geography, about one million uh, population, ethnically quite diverse. And that was a factor, of course, in our being able to get the CTR award as well. Uh, we uh, have a representation about equal to the United States in terms of uh, African-American, our Latino population and, and others as well. We have the 20th largest health system in the US, which is called Christiana Care. We have uh, several large research universities, primarily the University of Delaware and Delaware State University, which is a historically black university. Uh, we have our large children's hospital, which is Nemours, and we have uh, four residency um, institutions, among which they sponsor about, let's see, number of residency and fellowship uh, programs between them is probably in excess of about 50, but largely Christiana Care and Nemours uh, do the residency programs. <clears throat> Just a little bit about where we are because COVID has taken over our lives in so many ways. Uh, and of course, it has led to some 
occasional side benefits, such as the development of tele-technology, by which, of course, we can see each other uh, virtually today. So Delaware's COVID state, like the rest of the country, uh, has been accelerating off late, which we don't like very much. We are in upswing in terms of COVID in, in Delaware, um, which mirrors more if you uh, see we're on the upswing since uh, August. And that upswing last year really came in early November, late October. So that's worrying us because this upswing is looking a little sooner than last year's peak. Um, and of course, even with a vaccine, it uh, still unfortunately is a situation where not 100% of our eligible folks have opted to get the vaccine. Uh, same as in Puerto Rico. And again, there's an opportunity there for community engagement in that story. These are our fully vaccinated key metrics. And um, if you look on the left, uh, you'll see that about 500,000 folks have been fully vaccinated. So that's about half the population of Delaware, which means for the eligible population, that's probably something like 70% plus of the eligible population. That's okay, but it's not great. And then we look at the breakdown of those figures, and you see that among those who are fully vaccinated, that most of the, the highest percentage of fully vaccinated individuals is over 65, which is good news. That's 95% of over 65 have become, uh, have had at least one dose by age, which is great. But then the number drops off rapidly. And then we see that there's less than 75% between 50 and 64, and that drops to less than 50% or so with the first dose between the ages of 18 to 34 and 12 to 17. So as I mentioned down here, this is a good uh, question for community-engaged research. Why do we have this discrepancy in terms of vaccine uptake when it is free, it is available, it is accessible, it is as safe as any vaccine is? What it might be the community-engaged reasons? And that's where I think the tools of CTR and CER help us uh, hopefully answer some of those questions. So some things that we are considering as well. I put this up here because I, I like the CDC's model for the social vulnerability index. Uh, that has implications for CER as well. And the SVI is a, the tool that's available online, and I've put the link there as well for researchers who would like to look at that. But for example, the SVI score, uh, the darker is the more vulnerable, and the vaccinated individuals you can see here, less vulnerable, more vaccinated, upper right corner, more vulnerable, less vaccine in the lower left corner. I give this just as an example of ways that you can characterize the readiness of a community and their vulnerability through scores like the SVI, and that helps address or tailor our community-engaged research questions. A little bit of background about the Delaware Health Sciences Alliance and about our Excel program. So the DHSA was formed um, quite a while ago. Interestingly, it was formed as a response at that point to apply for a CTSA award, a Clinical Translation Science Award. That was back in 2005. We decided that we would be better off together. And so the uh, our main health system, Christiana Care, our medical school system, Thomas Jefferson University, our Children's Hospital, Nemours, and the university, the top four partners you see there, they founded the Delaware Health Sciences Alliance. Over time, I was privileged to, to work with them, and I took over as CEO a couple of years ago. But we initially got together, in fact, to, to put our research heads together. Well, unfortunately, you know, we learned a lot from, from sometimes uh, lack of success as well, so we did not achieve a CTSA. But we through the DHSA, we found that the better mechanism for our work was, in fact, the CTR mechanism. And the CTR mechanism was a good fit for us because it allowed for uh, more innovation in terms of what we wanted to do. It actually encouraged community engagement before it was, you know, the, a sexy idea. Um, it was more collaborative, we found, because similar groups in other idea states, uh, such as Puerto Rico, we were able to collaborate with them. And CTRs, as Dr. Luciano mentioned, are an amazing you know, way for us to collaborate. We get together at each other's conferences, and we get together CTR conferences by region. Sometimes we come to different regions, conferences, learn a lot. So idea states are small but mighty, as we like to say. So Delaware also already had the IMBRI program, uh, our basic science program led by Dr. Stephen Stanhope, so it made a lot of sense. Over time, the DHSA grew to include other partners as well, such as Bay Health, which is another health system in Delaware, the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine, and the Delaware Academy of Medicine. But really, CTR was where the DHSA first started, so I always want to acknowledge that. Uh, the Alliance now does many more things as well, of course, in terms of education and, and research and clinical work, but it started all with CTR. 
Um, these are the partners in our Delaware CTR, the University of Delaware, Christiana Care, Delaware State University, the Children's Hospital, and Medical University of South Carolina, um, who was our partner in the first cycle of funding and have remained so in this cycle as well. We are in a second cycle of CTR funding, so we're approaching the, um, uh, uh, nearly the end of our second uh, five-year cycle. So definition of uh, clinical and translational research, of course, is a CTR refers to the application of research findings from basic science to policy and practice-based research to ultimately improve the public's health and to global health as well. So that's the whole idea, from bench to bedside to population, and then look at the issues at the population level and bring them back to the bench and back to the bedside to say, how do we study this? We see something in the community, let us study this. We're studying something at the bench, let us apply this. That's the cycle of clinical and translational research. So as you can see, therefore, community-engaged research is a critical part of CTR because it relies on this feedback loop uh, between communities and between researchers. So community-engaged research actively incorporates and in fact listens to and responds to community voices, especially those in under-resourced communities because they tend to be sometimes the ones most affected by the health issues that we're trying to solve. So within CER, we recognize that communities are in fact the driving force of research. And I can't emphasize this enough. It really means redoing how we do research. In the older model of research, so to speak, it was driven by researchers, folks like, for example, some of us who are on the call. I'm primarily you know, a physician and a, and a researcher and administrator. I might say, you know, here's what I see based on the data, and I would like to help solve this problem. But it's very different than engaging with a community member and having them say, in our community, we see A, B, and C. We would like help in addressing the problem. And research may or may not be part of addressing that issue. But that's part of the negotiation when you get into community-based research. So it does also mean this context of shared power and respect. That is the one of the fundamental parts of community-engaged research. It requires academic members, you know, folks perhaps, all of us are in a community, but all of us, uh, my primary identity may perhaps be more as an academician. So it requires us to become partners with the community and become to be, have them be part of the research team not just us doing research on the community, but with the community and in fact, with their leadership. And these are definitions that we live by ourselves in our community engagement outreach core in the Delaware Excel. So our experience as scientists, as you know, engaging with the community has not always been positive, right? There are numerous well-known examples, and this is not a talk on all the terrible things that science has done over the years, but hopefully about all the good we can do. But there have been examples of experimenting on community members. There's a famous uh, Tuskegee syphilis experiments in, in the American South. Um, there's the utilization of material without community members' permission, such as the Henrietta Lacks or HeLa cell line, which is critical to basic science research. But many of those mistakes of the past and missteps of the past have helped improve uh, us in the future and helped improve, we think, over time, our relations with the community. But it first takes honesty to admit that things were not done right. And perhaps in some ways, we should hold ourselves accountable and say, are we still engaging the community as much as we can? For example, in the Tuskegee syphilis story, um, there were lots of lessons learned. It's now part of every uh, IRB training, every city training, every research training that we have for junior researchers and for communities. The Henrietta Lack story was very, very important as well. Um, much of that story was centered around Baltimore, around my former training grounds of Johns Hopkins. And, you know, I would encourage you to look at the links that I have put in here at some point at your leisure. Um, you will see that our, my colleagues at Johns Hopkins, uh, especially I want to call out my friend, Dr. Dan Ford, who had their CTSA. Uh, he also serves as one of the co-chairs of the Henrietta Lacks Annual Symposium at Johns Hopkins, where the Lacks family actually co-produces an event every year to be able to share the stories that they have learned and to continuously educate the community and researchers about the powerful nature of this, what was done, what was wrong, and how we can be better as researchers going forward. So for many of these terrible things, some good in science and community engagement has uh, occurred and hopefully will continue to. So within Engaging community in CTR, as I mentioned, there does remain significant mistrust. And for those of you who work in community-based research or any research, you might think about patients or community members who sometimes feel like they are 
talked down to, um, there's a concern that they're being experimented on, or are we being treated like guinea pigs? Or even when we try as researchers, perhaps saying, well, let's reimburse you for your time. Do they feel like we're just bought off with a store card for a few dollars of their time? And really what that means is we're not doing a good enough job of engaging our community as partners. And that's the key thing. Uh, we want to be partners, but we also want to be leaders. Well, then we must give community members the same respect uh, at, the, at the same time. So community engaged research really is not so much a, a methodology, it's more a philosophy. It's more a value system that says, I will prioritize the voice of the community and the voice of the patient. Um, I will listen to my community members and I will in fact partner with them and I will give them equal power if that power is mine to share. And otherwise I will go and humbly listen and find out what my community members' priorities are and see where that overlap might be. So it's really a collaborative process between the researcher and partners to create and disseminate knowledge and then to contribute to the well-being of the community. And again, this was taken from our own community engagement core. And I want to thank Dr. Heather Bittner Fagan, who at that time served as the uh, component chair of the, uh, of the CEO. So some of the core values we found to be helpful in community engagement and outreach, collaboration, equity, humility, transparency, and impact. And I know that those will resonate with many of my colleagues in the Hispanic Alliance for CTR as well. Um, we like the approach of nothing about us without us, and that's from the community's perspective. We like to believe that everyone is an expert in something and that everyone is a learner. And with that approach, we don't think that the researcher is the only expert in health issues. The people with the health issues frequently are the experts, right? For those of you who are physicians uh, or clinicians, you know that when a patient comes in, much of the diagnosis is made through the history and then some of it through the physical exam. But the history is asking the patient. And I, I was telling Dr. Luciano, I had my clinic hours this morning and I asked my patients sometimes who come in with a certain kind of condition, a certain kind of pain. I said, what, what do you think is happening? because they're the ones who live with the pain. They're the ones who've had this for the last several weeks or months. And they're the ones who will say, what are they concerned about? What might it be? And therefore, where should my mind be at in terms of addressing their concerns while also using my expertise to think about, well, maybe it's not a urine infection. Maybe it's not appendicitis. Maybe it's just a muscle strain. That's okay. But if they're concerned about cancer or appendicitis, and if I don't attend to that or deal with that at some level, we're not going to partner in their care. And partnering with the community is very similar to partnering with a patient in my view. Of course, that's my bias, of course, as a, as a physician as well. So some of the how, in terms of how we have done this, and these are some of the lessons that I think we've, we've shared across CTRs. Uh, as Dr. Luciano said, the CTR family across the country is a wonderful one. We learn from, from you all and hopefully vice versa. Um, the need to engage the community begins much before we solicit a research proposal. I would even argue that once the research is already in place and we have not thought about the community, you cannot tack it on. You can't add it as an option later on. You know, So you have to build the car with it. It's like the engine of the car. It's not like the, you know, it's not like the air condition that you can add later on. So the need to begin begins before we solicit proposals. Community engagement has to be built. Unfortunately, it is not innate to how we do science. Science was not built with community engagement in mind. NIH study sections, if you think about that, who do they include? Researchers. They don't have community members on study sections. Uh, they include highly qualified MDs and PhDs and others in that. So we must then bring together groups of expertise through CTR mechanisms to discuss groups and workshops, to discuss an issue, not just a protocol. We have to discuss what is the problem we are trying to solve. And if the problem we're trying to solve or some part of it is diabetes or asthma or violence in the community or heart disease, then we will come together and we will talk to each other respectfully. To facilitate those respectful discussions, I think the community advisory committees uh, with, that are embedded within CTRs or some mechanism like that, that is absolutely critical. These groups, as you all know from the Alliance perspective, are really important ways for the community to have their voice heard and for the researchers to partner side by side and negotiate and say, well, this sounds like a good idea, but you're telling us this, how do we align our mutual expectations? That's when it leads to this natural alignment of certain ideas. 
We also have to be realistic. Not every community need will be met. Not every research need will be met. As a researcher, I might go in thinking, you know, I want to do a, a, you know, a, a clinical trial on this new medicine for heart disease in the community. Well, the community might say, well, heart disease may not be a biggest issue. We think it's chronic kidney disease. Okay, well, then I have to negotiate that. What is the overlap between heart disease and kidney disease? How do I get to study what I am expert in? But why do I respond to the community's needs to study what they're interested in? And that's part of the negotiation of community engagement. So every time we review a proposal, we should ask certain questions. And this is important, even if the reviewer is a scientist and not a community member or community of need. Why is this research important to health? What is the point of this research? If it's important, can we see in the application those whom it impacts? For example, if a research program is purporting to uh, help those who have asthma, did somebody who have asthma help write the proposal? Were they part of the review? Were they included in the research project at any point beyond just being subjects? And that's the key difference. If you see what I'm saying, most proposals that I bet you've come across don't include the community. Even asking this question might be a radical question saying, why would you include a community member on a proposal investigator team? Or why would you include them in the review committee? But that is the difference between community engaged research and every other kind of research that we do. How do we bring research in the communities then together to solve problems? And how do we engage both sides of the continuum and make both sides aware of the problems they're in? Sometimes it means restructuring everything. So if we take we take my words to heart. We say that the community has to be engaged in research proposals. That means restructuring everything. That means restructuring even how we meet to discuss proposals. Maybe we don't meet at the university anymore. Maybe we meet in the community. Maybe our study section has two community leaders who may have a different scientific understanding. Maybe we have to not speak in jargon. Perhaps we have to speak in layman's language, which is frankly is actually better science anyway. Otherwise, we I don't know if you have the same experience I do among scientists. Sometimes we say things in a complex enough way. Other people don't even ask a question because they don't even understand what you're talking about. But if you were required to explain it to the level of another intelligent person who is a good in their field, but not from our field, then I think we all understand it better as well. I don't understand the field of you know, uh, specialized fields within medicine um, as much as the specialists do. So we rely on that kind of interaction. Community engagement is exactly the same. Every year, we, uh, are, are, we have an annual community engagement conference, which in fact is our annual conference. And every year we select presentations for that conference. And uh, I was actually very pleased that for the last couple of years running, I've invited our colleagues from the Hispanic Alliance, uh, even before it had that name. And two, three years ago now, before COVID, we had colleagues from Puerto Rico come to the community engagement conference as well. Um, and I'll show you some photos from, from that visit later on. But um, you know, we learned a lot from that conference. We bring community members and researchers together. We have as conference co-chair, the chair of our community advisory committee. Her name is Dr. Marlene Saunders. She's a social worker by training and she's the chair of our CAC and she helps represent the voice of the community. But she's a co-chair, that means as a fellow co-chair myself, I share my authority and responsibility with her and likewise, and we negotiate on what we're going to have the conference be about. We also include the community members on uh, the review panels. Every paper has to be reviewed by a community member as part of the review panel. That's just, that's just the way it is. It's like saying a paper on heart disease should not be reviewed by, by a specialist in heart disease. That would be very silly. So how could we possibly have a, have a research project on the community not being reviewed by a community member? So we treat it like that. Sometimes, and we tried this a few years ago, it was quite successful, we have the presenters be uh, paired, researcher and community member. And that can actually be very powerful. The whole tone of the research changes, the audience changes. And so that's actually very exciting. We require that ahead of time. We say that to be accepted for presentation at the conference, we would like there to be uh, a PI from the institution and also a PI or a co-presenter from, a, from, a, from the community. And that's powerful because that changes how they even prepare the presentation, how they talk to each other. All of a sudden research and community, they literally have to partner because they're going up on the podium together and that, that matters a lot. So that's, that's very powerful. 
there's a couple of uh, couple of photos from some of those conferences where you see uh, folks kind of interact, community members and and students and 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 others. Uh, they all like uh, coming to our coming to our event and and chatting and and discussing. Uh, here was just one model that I wanted to show for how one might actually do it in practice. Uh, we don't follow this exact model, but this was a model from a couple of papers that are prominent in the field. So as we do this community buy-in, it helps to stage out the events. So you can have a vision phase, a valley phase, which is the intervention phase, and then the victory phase, which is the dissemination phase. You can have a kickoff conference, which really talks about community buy-in, right? Maybe the first year you do a kickoff conference, get the community involved, uh, focus on things you do together. And then you figure out what is our research fit with the vision of the community? What does that look like? The next conference focus more on um, collabor commitment to collaborative data analysis. You've done a project together. What does it look like? What do the results mean? Do they go in the direction we want? Are we going to co-publish? Should we have some names on this work together? And what's the next thing we're going to apply for? The dissemination conference is the partnership maintenance conference or some event like that. That's when we disseminate the study findings and start talking about policy changes and improved health outcomes. We say, we did this work together. Here was the point, we keep drawing that arc of translational research. We did this work at the bench or at the bedside, and I wanna take this out and expand it to the community. And we'd like to think about that. So that's, that's critical for us. So this is just one model for, for how this might work. Another one of the how uh, from our uh, situation here in, in Delaware, the Alliance runs a, uh, the Delaware Alliance, of course, we have two alliances, the Hispanic Alliance and the Delaware Alliance. I, I love that partnership, by the way, the fact that both of our teams are called alliances, I like that. Um, our Delaware Alliance runs a research competition, which is called, which is modeled after a Shark Tank kind of event. And for those of you who have seen the TV show, Shark Tank, you know that uh, typically you'll have people coming in to make a pitch about an idea, and they present to a group of sharks who then decide whether to invest money or not. We do the same thing. We do it in a modified study section approach. Basically, what we do is we give our materials to the study section ahead of time, which includes leaders from all of our alliance partners, as well as community members. And then we don't just put them in a room and say, you decide by yourself. We make the decision live. We put them in front of, the, we put them in front of an audience. We have the researchers come in. So the researchers then pitch in 15 to 20 minutes what their research idea is to this to this panel. The panel's already read the materials ahead of time. Then we have some Q&A. We have some 15 minutes of public Q&A as well. It is an amazing and powerful opportunity for the public to see what research looks like. For them to hear in lay terms, a researcher coming up and rather than saying, I would like to study the hedgehog gene, they actually have to articulate, I would like to study birth defects in children this is a birth defect I'd like to study. We think this is the impact this research might have on the community. I would like your support for this project. Here are, my, here are our partners doing this work together, affected communities, researchers, bench scientists, physicians. That's very powerful. And the people will ask questions about it. They'll say, explain to me, what is a birth defect? How does this work? And so forth. So very, very interesting. This has been a successful, uh, successful and kind of coaching presenters to be community oriented while also being scientifically rigorous. We think we can we can certainly uh, we can certainly do both. Um, so we really appreciate uh, really appreciate this this idea. Um, we enjoy having this type of event not to replace the NIH study section type approach, but in fact to demonstrate, in fact to our colleagues in science and the NIH, you can do things with the public involved. And you can do things with a researcher being able to make a case for their own work. Um, and we've done this for several years. And I want to thank Pam Gardner, who's our uh, lead program manager, who helps, uh, helps run this event for us. So just, just one idea there. <clears throat> a couple of other things that I wanted to share as well. And I certainly want to leave a little time for our uh, question, questions from, from the team as well. So I'll, I'll wrap up in about 10 minutes here. Um, the idea of health in all policies, for those of you who are members of the American Public Health Association or other groups, you know there's an idea of health in all policies. We like to believe community matters. They should be community in all policies. Community engagement, in fact, needs the highest visibility, in my view, of any part of uh, clinical translational research. For those of you who remember, and Dr. Luciano uh, and Dr. Cruz might remember this from the very first round of CTRs back about, uh, I guess, two cycles ago, 10 years ago, community engagement was not a required component for CTRs. It was an optional component. 
our team was one of the only ones in that CTR first round that made it a component and was very serious about it. And because of that, our colleagues at NIH came back to us and said, we like what you've done with this. We like what you've learned from this. We're going to make it a recommended or required component now. And now there's no CTR, I don't think, in the country that would put together an application without having very strong community engagement. So this is important, but we have to keep pushing to make it scientific and rigorous. Just a committee is not going to do the trick. We have to integrate community engagement, every aspect of research. As an NIH person, they should look and say, they should be asking these questions. Um, but I think we, we're mutually learning. They should be asking the question, how are the community engaged in every aspect of research? And we have to challenge ourselves to help answer that. Components exist for a reason, as you know, uh, for those of you who write grants and who are familiar with the arcane uh, nature of uh, CTRs, you know they have components. There's an MP biostats component, there's a, a tech component, there's a evaluation component. These are not optional. These are important and essential. Community engagement similarly should not be optional and they should be integrated across. It's in my view, the most fun component, even as a scientist and a physician, I love the idea that we can integrate across different, uh, different groups to bring folks together. The other piece I wanna mention is how essential it is to garner support from all levels. You know, we talk about getting support from politicians, getting support from our elected officials, but here's the challenge. Our elected officials are not scientists for the most part. So when I go to them and say, hey, you know, we wanna build a new, a new cancer lab and we're gonna be studying this particular gene. You can just see folks' eyes glaze over, right? They're like, oh, that sounds interesting. But you go to them and say, I wanna help the community deal with a violence epidemic. Boy, that's important. Guess what? That is not just, not just as simple as getting votes. That is actually critically important public health and societal issues. That is what you know, our elected officials um, work for. They work for make our lives better, hopefully, and improve our health issues. If we talk to our elected officials about community engagement and research, that's a dialogue we can have. That's the way to engage them in clinical and translational research. CTR, even as a term, can be sometimes tough to understand. But you talk to the governor or the mayor or somebody else, elected official, they'll be excited by that. That was certainly our experience from, from, from Delaware. Up here is uh, our team photo from the end of our first cycle. The gentleman in the middle is Governor John Carney, who's uh, still the governor of Delaware, having been elected to a second term. Um, uh, governor Carney was a big supporter of the Delaware CTR XL program, and the state has a funding match as well that they provide to, to CTR. The rest of our team there includes our uh, PIs and co-investigators and component leads. And of course, uh, uh, this is Marlene, who I just mentioned earlier on the left. Uh, she's our community advisory council uh, co-chair. On the right is a more recent uh, meeting, and this is at the University of Delaware. Uh, this includes the, the president of the University of Delaware, who's in front, uh, Dr. Dennis Asanis, the commissioner of health for the state, the lieutenant governor for the state, Bethany Hall Long, and you may recognize this gentleman in the back standing next to me, who at that time was, uh, had not yet become president, but since has, but he was always a very big supporter of bringing research to Delaware, of bringing the right kind of research, and to help Delawareans, in fact, develop research that can maybe even inform the world. And we are hopeful that much of the work we've done in Excel, we can see replicated, uh, perhaps even across the country now with the national stage that the president has. So some of the references here I want to mention, I didn't make this heavy on references. I did want to mention these five uh, top uh, publications, which I think are important. Um, the first one is, is quite good. It's practical tips for establishing partnerships with academic researchers. a great resource guide for, for CBOs, community-based organizations. And it specifically focuses as case studies about uh, Latino communities as well. Uh, the second one is about a community academic partnered grant writing series. I think we had a question in the chat about community engagement on this as well, and uh, this may be a reference to, to help with that. Uh, the fourth one is about a CTR pilot grant program that again facilitates community academic partnership. This is experiences from Colorado. This is where I stole some of those ideas about um, engaging community members in uh, reviewing proposals and even writing proposals. <clears throat> The best thing about CTR, as Carlos said, is really the fact that we can steal each other's ideas, our best ideas, and make each other better and say, let's help you with your application or reapplication. That will help all of us improve. 
Uh, some other good resources here, the Association for Clinical and Translation Science, ACTS. It's still quite basic science focused, but we've actually presented our community engagement work at their annual conference. A little bit different, but I think we have to <clears throat> keep going to the CTS conferences to, to present what uh, we, we do well. Uh, the cityprogram.org list that I put down here, an excellent presentation that is on the city program website. <clears throat> It's by my colleague, uh, Dr. Marianne McDonald from Duke. And it's a really terrific presentation uh, on practicing CER. It's a little more basic than today's talk. It's perhaps really good for um, orienting a community advisory committee to the idea of community engaged research. And that is free to access online as well. Um, this is the Delaware Health Sciences Alliance uh, information. Um, we have, again, in keeping with our community engagement, we have our Instagram, our Twitter, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, of course, our website as well. My email and contact is here. Um, and I want to thank really all of our DHSA leadership for initially having the vision to engage in clinical and translation research helping uh, put together the Excel program. And now, of course, the Excel program is just one part of uh, our engagement, but Excel is, is, is amazing in its own right. Um, I want to thank all my friends and colleagues uh, in, in Puerto Rico. As, uh, as some of you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of Puerto Rico. I've been coming there for a long time. Um, my favorite coffee in the world is Puerto Rican coffee, which I'm having right now in my, in my Puerto Rico mug. Um, some of these visits are from a less happy time. They're from just after Hurricane Maria. And uh, it was, a, as uh, you all know better than anybody else, a very difficult time uh, for, for folks on the island. And I was fortunate enough to partner with our colleagues at uh, Ponce Health Sciences University at PHSU. And um, uh, we brought some medical supplies down from uh, Delaware at that time. And it was a wonderful partnership, went out to the, the hospital Castanier in, uh, in the mountains as well uh, to kind of see what uh, the work they were doing. And uh, one of the medical students on the left lower here, his name is uh, Rene. He was a medical student at PHSU at the time. He was interested in the work we were doing. We got to keep in touch. Ultimately, he came and did a rotation actually with us in Delaware as a medical student. That's him on the right again, uh, just finishing his rotation. He actually stayed with me and my family um, as well during that time. And then he got into residency. He practices family medicine now, just finished his residency, starting his career as an attending physician uh, in uh, primary care. So very, very pleased with that partnership. Um, these are more recent, uh, more recent photos, luckily less of the hurricane time as well. Uh, some of you might recognize my colleagues, Dr. Kanira Thompson and Dr. Laura Dominic um, uh, from Ponce in, in the photograph here as well. And some of my favorite places I like to visit Last time, Carlos kept me busy enough that I could barely get out to the Cueva Ventana, but I got a photograph of that and the beach and El Yunque. But in my half a day that uh, I was not working, and of course, my, my favorite Puerto Rican coffee uh, there as well. So I want to end by uh, thanking uh, all of you, my colleagues, uh, all the investigators. I didn't have space for everybody here, but I certainly want to thank uh, the, the lead uh, PIs, Dr. Marcia Cruz and Dr. Carlos Luciano, and Yvette Molina, as always, for her wonderful administration, and our, my community engagement colleagues, our, uh, uh, our, our co uh, co-workers here in battle, uh, Drs. Edna Acosta and Dr. Marizetta Sanchez, um, and many, many others. So I, I thank you and uh, turn it back over to you, Dr. Luciano, uh, if there are any questions from the audience. Thank you again. Thanks very much, Dr. Kan. That was incredibly uh, interesting and uh, a lot of uh, important information. That, that was great. I'm so glad that you uh, took the time to uh, teach us. Now, uh, we have time for uh, questions. Um, I would suggest for people to uh, raise their hands, perhaps, so that we can uh, have people um, come in uh, one at a time. There are a Edna, couple of questions. Do you, have a, do you have a comment? Please go ahead. I don't know you can hear me. Yes, we can. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Khan, for that great lecture about your experience. We are very happy to continue this collaboration together. I was responding to a comment that was done by um, Michelle Martinez, and I, I agree with her in her um, recommendation regarding building up the capacity of community members 
to become reviewers and to do the kind of work we need as researchers. Um, so that's one of the activities that the Alliance have Im implemented this year. We have a new council um, of community research um, group of community-based organizations. Up to now, we have 21 representatives and we are building up the capacity to provide service to um, review pilot projects and other consulting uh, opportunities so we can build up as collaborators in research. So that was my only comment and thank you for this um, seminar. Thank you, Dr. Acosta. Uh, it was wonderful to meet you recently, of course, in uh, San Juan at UPR. And thank you for your comments in the chat as well. I think the Alliance's efforts to build capacity as part of the Community Research Health Council, I think are remarkable. I think that it's a really tough thing to do, as you know, building these alliances across a lot of diverse groups, uh, whether geographically or ethnically, and then trying to um, come to consensus or even agreement on the priorities, and then of course execute those priorities. It's critical and critically important work. Um, I think as this cycle of the of the project goes through, I know your activities will be very robust and very well appreciated by that community. Because I know when I've spoken with you, you're always community first, and I, and I love that approach, um, and I thank you for that. I think as we go forward, one thing we should keep thinking about, and maybe this is something for the other CTRs as well, how do we get the community engagement groups from the CTRs to be able to communicate more with each other? How do we form a network of community engagement groups? Because that really is where the power of CTRs comes in. You have lessons from your community that you have little tips and tricks. And I tried to put in this presentation really practical things that we did, something that you can take off the shelf and say, oh, I like that idea, let me steal that or yeah, that may not work so well for us. But I tried to do that and I'd love to have you and others be part of a CTR or CTSA wide uh, group that discusses approaches to community engagement. So you know, keep doing the good work um, and uh, very much look forward to continuing our, our collaboration. Thank you. Thanks, thanks to you. I have a question actually, Dr. Kan. Uh, you mentioned briefly the practice-based uh, research networks. How do they fit in with, with the type of community-based research that you're speaking about? And sure. specifically, we're trying to engage the federally qualified health centers as a, as a way of uh, approaching or reaching um, rural communities, communities that are not near San Juan and uh, have a very close relationship with their uh, federally qualified health centers. Uh, what are your thoughts about this? I think it's an excellent idea. Our FQHCs are a critical partner in this work. And I think too often, Dr. Luciano, we have seen in academia, we have seen them as clinical partners, but not as research partners. And certainly, you know, I'll speak only from our experience. In Delaware, we don't have a lot of experience in doing PBRNs, honestly. Where I was before in Vermont, we had more robust uh, practice-based research networks and PBRNs, but we don't have as much experience with that here. But what I think the power of this alliance, the broadest alliance possible, could be between FQHCs uh, in Puerto Rico. And as in Delaware, for example, we have uh, three FQHCs. I, I suspect in Puerto Rico, you have, you have more, it's a larger territory, probably more like 10, perhaps between seven and 10, I would, I would guess. But those FQHCs are your window into the community. And I think a strategy to engage leadership at the FQHCs and a community leader at the FQHCs would be wonderful. In a, in, a, in a different world, I think where community health workers were a critical part of the workforce, just like they are in Europe and other places, I think CHWs are that perfect bridge between academia and FQHCs and be able to connect that to the community and bring those lessons back to the mothership, so to speak, for the research and data analysis. But then we go back to the community mothership, which is away from San Juan, where we can get the actual information on the ground. So I would encourage a community health worker model to help facilitate that. And of course, PBRNs, as you develop yours or redevelop yours, I would encourage highly that community membership and community engagement be front and center in addition to data analysis, et cetera, which people usually think about first. Thank you. Um, I see some comments in the chat. Any other questions, additional questions, comments to uh, Dr. Kan? So I have a comment. It's Harold Saavedra from Ponce. 
Uh, hello, Dr. Saavedra, how are you? Um, <coughs> Fine, and you? Uh, uh, well, thank you. Give my best to all of my friends in, uh, at uh, PHSU, that's where you are. Yeah, so it's just a comment. One of my first uh, study sections in, in, uh, with the government was the uh, Department of Defense. And the Department of Defense, uh, they actually use uh, community members, uh, a third of the review. Uh, so these are advocates. Uh, and it was, uh, so he had two scientists, one advocate. So their, their score counted uh, one third. And that was an amazing experience because they will say, oh yeah, this is very important research because uh, bone pain, for example, to, uh, to us, is, 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 uh, th this is very important research. So it was a very, very different perspective. And a lot of these advocates had been uh, breast cancer patients. So, so, you know, the Department of Defense has done it. So perhaps NIH uh, eventually has to incorporate this model too. I like that approach and I really appreciate that perspective. Uh, there were some conditions I was thinking about this as you were speaking about the fact, first of all, the model is very sound. Uh, the Department of Defense as a government agency, if they can do it, certainly anybody can. The NIH has been moving more towards including community voices, but mm -hmm. I think including communities as partners in research, I think we are slowly all evolving together and we have to demonstrate that as CTR groups. We have to show, because we're the, you know, they give us the funding to be able to do this work, but we are the demonstration projects. We have to go to the communities. We have to show them that this is uh, worthwhile and it makes an impact. And if we can show that and demonstrate value, of course, they will include that in the next round. Um, we saw that from our own experience here. Uh, to your point about specifically breast cancer as well, I was thinking about examples from other fields, environmental health, uh, thinking about Puerto Rico and even environmental health, such a delicate ecosystem, right? After every major storm or this pollution, um, I've been to the bio bays numerous times. And each time we worry more about the fact that these photoflagellates who live in the environment, each time they'll be more affected because of such delicate little organisms. Um, when I went out to uh, Culebra, um, of course the beach was used once upon a time as a practice ground for, uh, for armament. And you still see the tanks and the armament there. That had environmental impact but the community members were included in that discussion too late, but they were ultimately included in terms of the remediation for environmental impacts. So the environmental health has a lot to teach us anyway about that. Within medicine, breast cancer is a great example. HIV AIDS is another one where advocates and patients and community members drove the science. So now to develop a new HIV drug without the key support of advocates, it's unthinkable. Advocates are, you know, they, they help run the show appropriately enough. The rest of science, I think, has some great lessons from that. So I thank you for the breast cancer example. And yes, we have to come up with case studies and pilot opportunities where we can demonstrate, push the leading edge, bleeding edge, make a community member a PI, see what happens, right? And really partner with researchers one-on-one -on -one and demonstrate how that works. Yeah. Uh, hi, Dr. Kam. This is Michelle Martinez from UCC. Hi, Dr. Thank Martinez. You. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Um, I cannot agree more and I echo the words from our colleagues, um, especially in the DOD, in some of the grants, you also have to have, as a member of your research team, a patient advocate. And that doesn't mean that that name is there just because it's there. I mean, this person needs to be involved within the science and within the outcomes of that grant. And then that is also increases the validity of what it is that you're proposing in your research. Um, so what I, I basically ex, uh, presented in the chat is that we have this group that we created for training patient advocates in breast cancer together with Barbara Segarra and Edna Pacheco at, at UPR uh, Medical Sciences Campus. And basically we brought in patient, uh, their breast cancer survivors that are interested in research and we gave them a series of trainings for one year. And then we basically introduced them to different scientific conferences that were more focused on uh, training applicants. And it's a snowball effect. They started on their own getting so excited and, and uh, supporting each other and getting more training. And now they're participating in, in different uh, 
review panels in different activities on their own. So it, it's a matter of giving them the tools and also us as scientists together working with the community and, and having a close communication and constant um, reminding us ourselves that it, it, is, it is all connected. So if we can, if we can go ahead and, and get some sort of training that it is very structured for them and then continuously uh, give feedback, I think we can, we can make this happen. And then we can incorporate more underrepresented minorities within these panels because as we all know, it, they're definitely needed. Agreed. Uh, Dr. Martinez, thank you, first of all, for, for the comment. And I really appreciate that you took the time to offer that in the links. We will ideally perhaps copy the link down so we can add that to uh, the material here, because what you shared about the work that um, uh, you're helping lead here, especially the ideas group, um, the increasing diversity to enhance advocacy in science, the Hispanics ideas group, I think that's, that's wonderful. I think that's the way to start is build a coalition and then look for the formal training to be able to do this work. Here's the good news and the bad news in my view. The bad news is there's no one standard training that I've seen that fits every model for, for CTRs in different settings. The good news is we can build it. And what we found when we started our community engagement work here, we found there was no off the shelf training we could do for our community advisory committee and our researchers to help put that together. We did it in partnership with some wonderful colleagues. And I think, I think it's a wonderful opportunity for collaboration. We can talk about this. Um, we have tried to model this. I think Dr. Luciano may be too modest to mention this, but I know I hopefully can elaborate. As part of the CTR in pilot projects, we've tried to model this work. We've tried to fund and give priority to areas which are from underrepresented minorities, uh, ethnic groups, um, uh, diverse sexualities, gender representation, and so forth. Um, within Puerto Rico. So within the EAC, the External Advisory Committee, we are very keen to help promote all the wonderful diversity that, uh, that Puerto Rico has to offer in terms of community. Also at the annual uh, scientific day, I think, which will happen again next year, hopefully, there's an opportunity to highlight some of these things and have do a brief training. There also is an alliance conference or retreat this year. And I think this could be an important uh, area to attend to. And I completely agree with you, a workshop on this uh, topic would be important. Online, I shared a couple of resources there, but let's be in touch. And if we can help co-develop something that is useful to you, um, you know, we'd be happy to uh, happy to do that. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. And I think Edna actually placed a question in the chat room. Very good. I'll read, I'll scroll down there. Okay. Uh, best practices to retain community members in research efforts. Um, reimbursement recommendations for the institutions to implement. Good question, uh, Dr. Acosta. So retention mechanisms have to do with engagement, which only a small part of it, which is I think financial. Financial is critical, but it's one part of it. For example, I think one starts with, this may sound basic, but it starts with respect. You know, we come to work every day, not just because we draw a paycheck, but because we feel valued and because the work we do is important. I would do a good intake with all of my community member colleagues and say, what would it take for you to feel a part of this group, to feel empowered and respected? And then do a check-in every so often to say, are you still feeling engaged, empowered, respected, and feeling like your voice is not just heard, but in fact, is part of leading the change. And if that's not happening, money won't work. In addition to that, however, in addition to respect and feeling valued, of course, there are practical considerations, just like for all of us. If I invite one of you to come to our institution uh, to give a workshop or something, of course, we will cover your, uh, your travel costs and so forth. If I invite a community member to come to some place that's not in their neighborhood, I would be expected to cover their costs for transportation, logistics, perhaps childcare, perhaps other unanticipated expenses. But I should ask them ahead of time, what does it take for me to respect your time and offer you the appropriate compensation for you to come. I don't think there's one size fits all for reimbursement recommendation. You can use um, the US government standard per diem rules, but I think it starts with a conversation around what does it take to be respected and money is a part of that. And again, happy to talk offline more about this and maybe help develop guidelines if you would like. Uh, but I think it, it really is about the bigger picture and within that money is a, a critical feature, but not the only one. 
Oh, that was great advice. We would like to thank you again, Dr. Kan, for uh, taking the time and for this incredibly, incredible lecture that you've given us. Uh, we definitely will keep in touch, um, and I'm sure a lot of the attendees are going to be sending you messages, and obviously uh, I encourage them to uh, send uh, questions and, uh, as, they, uh, as we keep learning about community-based um, research and engagement. Thanks again, Dr. Kan. Thank you, Dr. Luciano. Hope to see you soon. Take care, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for the questions and thoughts. Have a good afternoon.